I want to talk to you tonight about God is up to something good. That's the title of my message. God is up to something good. Tell your neighbor God is up to something good. We welcome all those that are watching online tonight as well. And I encourage you to really take hold to this message that the Lord has put in my heart for us today. Turn with me to Job 22 and verse 21. In Job 22 verse 21, the Bible says, Acquaint now thyself with him. Acquaint yourself with the Lord. And be at peace, thereby good shall come unto thee. Now, you know, the word acquaint means to be familiar with. If you're acquainted with somebody, you're familiar with them, right? And you can tell if a person is acquainted with someone else that you know, you know them very well. And somebody else says something about them, well, you real quickly, you know whether they are acquainted with that person or not based on what they say about them. You know, if somebody came up to me and, and said, Boy, that old Milton Johnson, you know, that's a sorry, no good rascal. Well, right then, I know that they're not acquainted with the same Milton that I'm acquainted with, right? But yet, you know, people, they say they're acquainted with the Lord, but you can tell by what they say about the Lord that they're not really acquainted with him, okay? They may have heard of him, and they may have heard of some things other people said about him, but they're not really acquainted with him. They're not real familiar with him. Have you ever heard anybody say, for example, and I just wrote down a few things that I've heard. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, I believe God will heal me if it's his will? Huh? How about this? When you pray and ask God for something, sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, or sometimes he says wait a while. <laughs> I mean, I've heard people say this stuff. God put sickness on us to teach us a lesson. God won't put more on, on us than we can bear. And, of course, one of my favorites is this. You never know what God is up to. You never know what God's going to do. I'm going to tell you what. God is up to something good. Amen? Amen? See, we have to understand. This word good that he uses here, acquaint yourself with him and be at peace, thereby good will come unto thee. The word good in the Hebrew is tob, T-O-B-E, and it literally means welfare, prosperity, bounty, happiness. I mean, it's all good things, things that are full of pleasant, you know, and blessings and good things. He says, now, if you acquaint yourself with him and be at peace with him, he said, good, this good thing's going to come. All of this happiness and prosperity and blessing. The NET says this, reconcile yourself with God and be at peace with him. In this way, your prosperity will be good. Isn't that awesome? In this way, your prosperity will be good. You see, the world doesn't know what God is about to do. They don't know what he, what's going to happen next. And you hear them saying that. Well, you never know what God's going to do. You never know what's going to happen next. But you know, as God's children, every believer in Christ should know the will of the Father. We should know what God is going to do. Look with me in Colossians 1, 9. Here's a good verse for you to begin to pray out. Just put your name in there and begin to pray it out. Paul said, for this cause, we also, he said, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You see, God wants us to be filled with the knowledge of his will, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He doesn't want us to be ignorant of his will. He doesn't want us to be ignorant of his plan for, for our lives. He has a plan. The Bible teaches us, and it's from one end to the other. It's not just the Old Testament. It's not just the New Testament. It's all through the Scriptures that God has a plan to bless us. Amen? He wants to show us his goodness. Now, I don't know about you, but I want the Lord to bless me and cause good things to come to my life. Listen to me real carefully. If you have a Bible, you're holding the will of God in your hand because God's Word is His will. We know His will because it's revealed right here in the Bible. It's revealed in the Word of God. Now listen to the Amplified Classic of Job twenty-two twenty-one, the verse that we started with. He says, Acquaint now yourself with Him, 
agree with God, show yourself to be conformed to His work, will, and be at peace. By that you shall prosper, and great good shall come to you. You see, when you agree with God, you're in faith. Faith always agrees with God. That's what faith is all about. It's agreeing with heaven. Amen? Agreeing with God, what God says. He said, you'll prosper. Great good will come to you. you. Remember, David made this statement in Psalms 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, the app of, I believe it's the Passion Translation, says drink deeply. Because that word taste in the Hebrew means to drink deeply. Drink deeply of the goodness of God. Taste of God's word and know that he is good. He is good and his mercy endures forever. Amen? Amen. Now, you know, I want you all to understand something. Several years ago, there was a thing got in a lot of the churches and every time somebody say was, uh, somebody say God is good, everybody shout all the time. And they say all the time, everybody shout God is good. Well, that is true. He's good all the time and all the time God's good. There's never a moment in time when God is not good. He is essentially good. He's good to the core. That is his nature, that he's good. It doesn't get any gooder than God. You understand that? You can't get any, any gooder than God. All right? I know that's not good English, but anyway, you get the point that I'm trying to make to you. Never allow the enemy, never allow the world, never allow religion to ever think, cause you to think anything differently that God is really, really good, okay? And he loves me, and he wants me to experience his goodness, right? Now, he says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. This is Psalm 34, verse 8. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him, that trusts in God. Well, how do you trust someone? Blessed is the man that trusts in God. How do you trust someone? What causes you to trust someone? You believe their word. You believe what they said to you. When they tell you they're going to do something, you believe it, right? right? So if somebody says, well, I don't trust you, they're basically saying, I don't believe what you're telling me is true, right? Well, how many know if God is not a man, he should lie? It is impossible for God to lie, the Bible says. Impossible for God to lie. The prophets ask the question, has he said it? Shall he not do it? In other words, if God said it, it goes without saying that he's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. So when people, especially believers, if they say, you never know what God's going to do, that right there proves that they are not acquainted with him. They're not acquainted with his word because I know that he's going to do exactly what he said he was going to do in his word. Are you with me so far? Now, I'm going to make this point throughout this message tonight. Now, in Psalms 34, verse 19, David made this statement. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. You see, I may not know how he's going to deliver me, but I know that he will deliver me. Do you all see the difference here? I don't have to know how he's going to deliver me. All I have to know is, with my faith and my trust, that he will deliver me. No matter what kind of situation I find myself in, listen to me, I know that God's going to deliver me out of them all. Hallelujah. Now, having said all of that, I want to say this. God is up to something good. Tell your neighbor, God is up to something good. Say it like this. God is up to something good in your life. Now I say God is up to something good in my life. God is up to something good at Faith Family Church. Hallelujah. I'm telling y'all, you better get ready. If you want the goodness of God like you've never had it before, get ready. I'm telling you right now, just like the Holy Ghost spoke to my wife that night in that dream, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because I'm telling you, there are good things right on the edge. I'm talking about, listen to me. God wants to do some mighty things in this new year. That's what he told me to tell you last Sunday, out with the old. Get rid of all that old stuff. 
Get rid of those old thinking patterns, the old man, all right? Old friends that corrupt and bring you down and all that stuff. Get rid of it. If you haven't done it yet, do it. Make a decision. No more. I'm not staying there. I will refuse to be stuck any, any longer. I'm not even going to stay where I'm at right now in 21. I'm going to move on further. I'm going to another level. Listen to me. There's always another level. I said there's always another level. Now, I know when you get in these big buildings and these big hotels, there is a top level, what they call the top level or the penthouse, right? With the things of God, there's always another level. You never get to the top level. There's always another one. Hallelujah. And I'm reaching for it. I don't know about y'all, but I'm reaching for the high things, the high calling of God. Now, for those of you that don't know any better, listen to me. Uh, because I know there's a lot of people that are anxious about the coming year. They're wondering, some people even worrying, which is a sin. Uh, if you don't believe it, read your Bible, and you'll find out worry is a sin. Worry is proof that you don't trust God. And the Bible says be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled, right? In other words, he's saying, don't be worried, filled with anxiety about the inflation, about the economy collapsing, about the shortage, you know, to chain supply and all that. Amen? Amen? So here's what I want to tell you. God has put this in my heart to tell you. Don't ever say, I don't know what God is going to do. Just begin to say, he's going to bless me. Amen? And he's going to do us good. Amen. Look at Psalms 115, verses 13 and 14. Psalms 115, verses 13 and 14. He will bless them that fear the Lord. Everybody say, I fear the Lord. If you fear the Lord, that means you love Him, you reverence Him, you respect Him, you stand in awe of Him, you recognize Him, acknowledge Him as Creator of the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything that's in it. Amen. You know that there's no greater, none more powerful. There's nobody smarter, right? I mean, you stand in awe of Him. And He says He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. Small and great is talking about people that seem to be insignificant and the people that seem to be very important. It doesn't matter to God. It's all the same to him. But he'll bless anybody who will trust him, right? And then he says, the Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. See, there's where you've got to get serious with your faith. And you put your, your name in there. You write right in there, the Lord would increase me more and more, me and my children, right? Amen. That's reading my Bible says, the Lord will increase Eddie Smith more and more, he and his children. No, have you got rid of some of this old stuff yet? Huh? Have you let go of everything that's holding you back? Because I keep picking in my spirit that some people haven't let go of some stuff yet. Some old, old hurt, some old wounds, some old, you know, unforgiveness. You better let go of all that stuff. I'm telling you for your own good, turn it loose, get rid of it. Drive it out. Amen? Now, yeah, but, you know, the Lord's going to bless us, right? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. The Lord will bless us more and more. You, you had not got it. You had not got it yet. People are thinking, yeah, but what about the economy? What about the inflation? What about the chain supply shortage? There is no shortage of heaven's supply. There is no shortage of heaven's supply. Amen? Go with it, Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. Because a lot of people, they are thinking, yeah, but I know God wants to bless me. But what about everything that's happening in the world right now? They're telling us the interest rates are going to go up next year. Inflation's higher than it's been in 40, 50 years. There's, the, you know, the shortage of stuff in the, in the stores now. And, and what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, let me tell you what we're going to do. We're going to trust God. Because this is what God was telling me. I want my people to know that if they'll trust me and stay in faith, Regardless of what happens out in the world, I'm going to take care of my people. Just like he took care of the, the Hebrew people while they were living in Goshen, which was a small part of the, the nation of Egypt. Remember all the plagues and everything that happened to the Egyptian people? None of it touched God's people. God is able to protect you and to bless you and provide for you regardless of what's happening to everybody else around you. He says, but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called you by thy name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. 
when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. The New Century Version says, and one, not the whole thing, but just part of it. When you cross rivers, you will not drown. When you walk through fire, you will not be burned, nor will the flames hurt you. Now, I want you to notice the words, through the water, through the fire. When you walk through, did y'all catch that? When you walk through it. He didn't say if you get halfway through and drown or get burned up. No, he said you're going to go through it. Well, that means you've got to walk by faith. The thing I've been hearing the Spirit of God saying to me over and over and over for the last several weeks is, my people have got to learn to walk by faith, to move by faith. Know that I am with you, and when you are acting according to my word and being led by my spirit, regardless of what it looks like right in front of you, the test, the trial, the impossibility, just know that I am going to move mountains. I'm going to work miracles. I'm going to open doors. I'm going to bring new opportunities, but I cannot do it without you. You hear what I'm saying? God wants you to understand that he cannot work the miracles that you want and that you need without you. Because he does nothing apart from your faith. He does nothing apart from his word. Don't try to get him to do something that's not in agreement with his word. But secondly, he does nothing apart from your faith. And your faith can be seen. Your faith can, it, it has to be in action. Faith is an act. Wigglesworth used to say it all the time. Faith is an act. What do you mean an act? You remember those four guys, the four friends of the man that was, on, that was paralyzed? They took him on a cot to where Jesus was preaching, and because of the crowd, they couldn't get in. So what they do, went up on top of the roof, and they tore the roof off, and they laid him down in front of Jesus, and Jesus saw their faith. You can't see faith, literally see it, but you can see Faith in action, right? Faith is a force. Faith is a power that's released. And it was released when they simply acted, believing that if we go to all this trouble to get this man up on the roof, tear the roof off, and let him down in front of Jesus, that the power of God is going to be manifested to raise him up. And it was, right? Hallelujah. Go to 1 John 5, verse 4. 1 John 5, 4. You see, I want everybody to understand something. God's will is for every one of us to be victorious. Remember what Paul said in, in uh, I believe it was 2 Corinthians 2.14, thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph, always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. It's God's will for us to win, to be victorious. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. You're born of God, and you overcome the world. That's what God says. That's how God sees you. He sees you as a world overcomer. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Even our faith. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I really believe with all my heart that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and all those guys, they had read what the prophet Isaiah had written about God being with us when we walk through the fire and won't be burned. They knew. They had precedent. They had the word to stand on that the Lord will be with us and when we go through the fire, we won't be burned. And that's exactly what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember, because they trusted God, they came out. Not only were they not burned, the hair wasn't even singed. There was not even the smell of smoke on them, folks. I'm telling you, God can deliver you and remove every trace of what happened to you. No matter how, how bad it was, God can remove every trace of it from your life. That's the reason I told everybody last, last Sunday, you've got to get rid of all that stuff. You've got to put all that behind you. Stop holding on to it. Stop using it as a crutch. Amen? You're not a victim. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not a victim. You are a victor. And you have victory over the world through your faith in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were subjected to the fire. You know why? Because they wouldn't bow. They wouldn't bow to the world system. They wouldn't bow to the laws that had been made that when you hear the music, you've got to bow down and worship this image, you know, of a man, 
a false god. They wouldn't bow. They wouldn't bend. They wouldn't even bend, much less. But they wouldn't even bend a little bit. In other words, they wouldn't compromise. And because they wouldn't bow, and because they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't burn. And I'm telling you right now, the same thing is true for every believer today. You've got to know that this is for you. These things were written for our admonition as an example to us upon whom the ends of the world have come, Paul said. You've got to believe that God is with you and that he's going to deliver you. Look at Romans 8, 28. In Romans 8, 28, I want you all to see this the way that God meant for you to see it. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. I believe it's the NIV says that all things are working together for our good. All things are working together for our good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. You see, God is always working in our behalf. God is always working behind the scenes. And what He's working on is for our good. Don't ever look at situations that you find yourself in and wonder, well, why did God allow this to happen to me? And begin to blame God and begin to doubt God. That's exactly what the devil wants you to do. Read about these men like Daniel when they were thrown in the lion's den or those three Hebrew men that were thrown in the furnace, the fiery furnace. What did they do? They trusted God. They said what God said. They spoke the word of God. They refused to doubt. They refused to be afraid. Well, I'm sure in the natural, of course, you know, when you're looking at a fire and you're looking at a den of lion, there has to be some type of, you know, a, a something, you know, trying to take over you, causing you to panic and fear. But instead, they just trusted God. I'm going in and I'm going to trust you, Father God. Amen? So, guess what? God never promised those Hebrews, that they would not be thrown in the fire. He just promised he'd be with them and he'd bring them out. And he'd deliver them, right? And that they wouldn't be burned. Now, let's do be careful. It is not our place to work all things out for good. It is not my place to work everything out for my good. It is not your place, not your responsibility to work everything out for your good. It is our responsibility to believe that he will. Because he said he will. Amen? It's my place to stay in faith and to trust God in the face of difficult times, of test, impossible-looking situations. That's our responsibility. Why? Because we know that our Father is greater than all. So don't panic. Don't quit. Don't worry. Don't get in fear. Just begin to say, my Father is greater than all. He's greater than every mountain. He's greater than every problem. He's greater than every sickness or disease. Amen? Thank God he's greater. Now listen to me carefully. The Father God is bigger than anything that's happening in your life right now or that will ever happen. He's bigger. He's able to turn everything around for our good. Even if it looks like it's not going in the right direction, he's able to turn it around. Right? But once again, you have a part. I have a part. We've got to do our part. And if we'll do our part, you can be sure that God is faithful to watch over his word to perform it. Go over real quickly to James chapter 3. I know you all familiar with this. I'm not going to go in great detail about it, but I want to touch on it. Just in case you need to go back and read this, pray over this, practice this a little bit more. Because James makes this statement concerning our tongue. He says in verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths. They obey us. We turn about their whole body. We turn their body about. We turn it around, right? Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven to fierce winds, yet are they turned about or turned around with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor or the captain lists, wherever the ca captain wants it to go. Even so the tongue is a little member, boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Everybody see that? Now, I was telling somebody just recently, you know, God gave me this one time, and I was studying this years ago, and y'all have heard me preach about this. Some things may take longer to turn around than others, like a ship 
Imagine a great big ship. I mean, it's so big they land jets on it, you know. And it's out there in the ocean, and there's a terrible storm going on. Well, it takes longer to turn that thing around than it does a horse. Because a horse, you know, if you're on a horse, you know how to handle him. You can turn him around almost on a dime. You pull that thing, and he just turns, you know. Why? Because the body follows the head, right? He's talking about your tongue. That's how powerful your tongue is. Everything's going to follow your tongue. But yet it takes longer to turn that ship around. Nevertheless, it can be turned around. For example, it may be a small problem that you can turn around quickly. It may be a much bigger problem that may take you because of your, where you're at right now in your, in your development of faith. It may take some longer. It doesn't take God longer. It takes you longer to get to the place where it can be turned. Are y'all with me not what I'm talking about now? See, a lot of times, let's say, you know, you diagnosed, and it's nothing real serious, you know. It's nothing life-threatening, you know. You still carry on your daily life and work and all this kind of stuff. And you just tackle it, you know, with the word that you know, and you turn that thing around just like that. But then, in other cases, people will go to a doctor and they're diagnosed. Take Jerry Savelle, for example. Uh, my wife and I was listening to Brother Jerry just recently. And he was telling about uh, a few, very few short years ago that he had went for a checkup and they found a blocked artery in his neck and another blocked artery somewhere in his heart. And so they put him in the hospital. And even then the doctors told him it was just going to be kind of routine surgery. But during the surgery he had a stroke. Well, when he came, when he, when he woke up, he didn't know anybody. He didn't know his wife. He didn't know his children. I mean, he, he was paralyzed on one side of his body. He lost all of his memory. And the doctors told his wife and two daughters that he would never be able to preach again and that he would never recover from this. He said, but thank God for my wife and my children and my friends like Brother Copeland and different ones that knew how to stand on the Word and believe God for me. He said, when they sent me home, he said, I still could not speak. He said, but I could pray in tongues. Isn't that amazing? How your spirit man, listen to me, how your spirit man, even while you're asleep at night, your spirit is awake and in contact and fellowship with Almighty God, right? He said, I couldn't say a word in English, and I still had got my memory. He said, but I could pray in tongues. And he said, was it long before all of a sudden, he said, I had gone, what is his grandson? or a granddaughter or somebody had gone out to that place where he keeps all them cars, all them antique cars. And he said, uh, you know, they was kind of guiding me by the hand, and, and we was walking around. And he said, all of a sudden, just like that, he said, my memory came back to me. And he said, within weeks, he said, I was preaching all over the world again. But the doctor said, it'll never happen. The doctor said, it's impossible. The doctor said, you'll never, he'll never regain all his memory, never be able to preach again, and totally healed. Ten years older than me right now and going all over the world. Praise God. So I'm just telling you that always trust God no matter what you are facing because he's able to turn anything and everything around. So whether you're experiencing God's goodness and blessing or not, listen to me. It's not based on the world's economy. It's not based on the rate of inflation. It's not based on the supply chain, and all that kind of stuff. Whether you're walking in God's goodness and His blessings and prosperity is not determined by all that, okay? Now stay with me here because I want to give you some, some things I believe is going to help you as you press into this new year. <coughs> like I said, God's always working behind the scenes. Again, let me press this point. Y'all know Philippians 4.19, right? But my God shall supply... All of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So the question, listen to me. I want you all to get this right here. You may not know how he's going to do it, but by faith you know that he is going to do it. Right? I want you to approach every promise of God like that in this coming year. I may not know how. I may not know when. Listen to me, folks. Just concerning the future. You might not know Listen to the future, but you know who holds the future, right? And he knows the beginning, the end from the beginning. Look at this in Genesis 26, verse 1. 
The Bible tells us that there was a famine in the land. In Genesis 26, verse 1, during the time of Jacob, I mean Isaac, there was a famine in the land. In verse 2, God said, don't go to Egypt. In other words, don't look to the world system. In verse 3, he said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to perform the oath that I swore to Abraham. If you go to verse 12, it tells us that Isaac sowed. Now, here we are in a time of famine, a time of dearth, a time when people are starving to death all through the nation and other countries as well. But yet, here is a man who trusts God and he sows in famine. And the Bible says not only did he sow, but he received in the same year a hundredfold. One hundredfold. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 says he waxed great. What does that mean? And went forward and grew until he became very great. The complete Jewish Bible says the man became rich and prospered more and more until he had become very wealthy indeed. Did you know that the worst possible thing that a person can do during financial famine is to hold on to what little bit they have. That's the very worst thing that you could do. I was telling you about what happened to Brother Jerry. I was going back through some old notes and stuff, and I remember I shared with the church years and years ago. And uh, he said in 1981, in October of that year, now remember in October, the year is, you know, three quarters of the way through. In October of that year, he said, we were really facing a, a financial famine. He said, uh, uh, my wife and I, we were expanding the, mil- uh, the ministry. We were building. He said, we really needed a lot of money. And he said, the Lord told him that he would command his blessings upon him. He would rebuke the devourer, and he would bring the 100-fold return in the same year if he would obey him. So they agreed to sow in famine. And receive a hundredfold the same year. He said, we wrote 10 checks out of our ministry. He said, I have 10 major departments. I wrote a check for $1,000 from each one of those out of the budget of each one of those departments. And he said, uh, then, he said, we needed a bigger and a faster airplane for our meetings. So we sowed out of that account as well. He said, and then we personally sowed $1,000. He said, so a total of $11,000. And... He said, in the natural, it looked completely foolish to give that money away because we needed it so badly. But we sowed it into another ministry that God told us to sow it into. He said, just as soon as we mailed them, he said, that same day, later that day, we received a check for $10,000. The next week, he said, someone gave us an airplane, debt-free, $150,000 airplane. The same week, another person gave $100,000 to the evangelistic department. He said, in one week, over a quarter of a million of dollars came in financial miracles. And before the year was over, now remember, this was in October. He said, before the year was over, we had received a hundredfold of what we had sold. Amen. A hundredfold, hundred to one. Imagine that hundred to one. That's pretty good if I give you a dollar, somebody walks up and gives me a hundred. I'll trade that all day long. How about you? Huh? Folks, that's supernatural increase. How many of you want some supernatural increase? You got to believe to see the goodness of God. I said, you got to believe to see the goodness of God. See, I really cannot preach. Have y'all ever heard me say, I can't preach divine healing as strong as I believe it? Have y'all heard me make that statement? I cannot preach financial prosperity as strong as I believe it. I don't think we hardly have many people left. The more I study the Bible, the closer I get with God, the more acquainted I get with Him, the more I am 100% convinced that He wants His people rich. So we can do the work of the kingdom. Amen? I'm telling y'all, it's it's amazing. Just imagine for a moment. Would you want, if you were wealthy, would you want your children walking around with ragged clothes on, driving an old piece of junk car that breaks down two or three times a week, huh? No, you wouldn't want to. Think about your heavenly father. He owns it all. He owns it all. Now, you say, yeah, but everybody can't handle it. Exactly right. Exactly right. Now you're getting somewhere. 
Everybody can't handle it, right? It keeps pace. When God blesses us, that financial prosperity keeps pace with your integrity. Your integrity. It keeps pace with your spiritual growth. God won't be a part of something that's going to destroy you. If you had a kid, and by the time, I mean just as soon as the first time he got in the car, he just stomped it to the floor, ran all through the wood and tore the car to pieces. Well, you wait a year or two and you say, well, I'll practice with him a little bit, you know. And the next time you put him in another car and said, now I'm going to let you drive. And he did the same thing. He just took off, you know, laying rubber, and just I mean, just running crazy. Well, no, you're not going to buy him a nice car. No, he might kill himself with it, right? But if you approve to God that he can trust you, oh, my, 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 what the Lord will do. Oh, how much he will bless you. Amen. Amen. But you can't get a bunch of money and go ahead and run and got three or four women on the side. Disappear, you know, for weeks and weeks at a time because you're too busy, you know, you know, flying around to different islands and stuff instead of coming and being in the house of God. I'm not saying you should take vacation, but I'm saying this, this has got to get be first priority in your life. The things of God has got to be first priority. Now, look with me, please, in 1 Kings 17. I'm going to give you three things real quickly that I believe you'll find a pattern of this throughout the Bible that um, I'm talking about when you study people who, who has experienced supernatural increase, there's a pattern of three things that are needed to experience it. Here we, we're going to start in verse 1 of 1 Kings 17, verse 1. Let's read the first uh, nine verses. Elijah the Tishbite uh, said to Abraham, that the Lord God of Israel is by whom I stand. There shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word, the prophet is talking, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Go drink of the brook. Now watch this. He said, Hide yourself at Cherith, and it shall be, you shall drink of the brook. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there, and it shall be. And he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and dwelt at the brook Cherith, that's before Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and flesh. That's what I call a sandwich. And bread and flesh in the morning and the evening. And he drank of the book. Look now. It came to pass after a while the book dried up because there had been no rain in the land. The book dried up because there's no rain. How many of you want the rain of God's Spirit? Things dry up but there's no rain. Okay? I, you need the rain of the Spirit constantly. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, Go to Zarephath that belongs to Zidon. Now watch this right here. I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. God said, I've commanded her. Now, keep that in mind right there, okay? And so, think about this. First of all, you need, number one, a word from the Lord. A word from the Lord. Verse 9 tells us that God had already talked to this woman. Folks, he's always a step ahead of us, right? He knows what it's going to take to get your needs met. So the first thing you need is a word from the Lord. Let's read verses 10, 11, and 12. So he arose, he went to Zarephath, he came to the gate of the city. The widow woman was there gathering sticks. He called and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. As she was going to fetch it, he said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives. I don't have a cake, just a handful of meal in a barrel, a little oil in a cruise. I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Now, wait a minute. God said, I have commanded this woman to take care of you, right? Well, she doesn't act like it. You know why? Her vision is limited. Her vision is so limited, she's planning for this to be her last meal with her and her son. And that's as far as she can see. That's as far as she can see as using what little bit of meal and oil that she had to make one last cake of bread for her and her son to eat. She's limited. Now, here's what you got to understand. We know that God already spoke to her because he said he had. But undoubtedly, what God said to her went completely against her natural reasoning. Natural reasoning, natural logic will do everything it can to convince you that what you think you heard God say couldn't be God. 
Are you hearing what I'm telling you? I remember, especially those first few times when God spoke to us about giving large amounts of money in an offering. Man, my mind was just like, there's no way. Lord, you know what I got. And you know what bills I got to pay. You know the responsibility that we have. But yet you're telling me to give this. And I know real quickly in my lightning fast mind that if I give this, I'm not going to have the money to pay that. But you know what I learned? I learned do not allow natural reasoning and logic to rob you of supernatural increase. Because it will. And it almost robbed her. It almost robbed her of her very life and the life of her son. The supernatural increase that came. But you know what? Thank God. See, God told her, take care of this prophet. Take care of this man of God. And undoubtedly, she must have said, I can't. But yet, she needed supernatural increase. Look at verse 13 again. Verse 13, Elijah said, fear not. Go and do as you have said. Make me a little cake first. Bring it to me. Then make one for you and your son. Now, here's what I want you all to get, okay? You've got to obey. This, this is wild right here, Okay? You need a prophetic word from God, a rhema word. And here it is. The barrel of meal shall not waste, verse 14. Neither shall the cruise of oil fail. That's the word from God. But you've got to obey the word, right? See, ask yourself, what is God saying to me? Because what you're hearing right now, the message you're hearing right now may be the word of the Lord for you. There may be something that God takes of what I am saying and impresses upon your heart, and that's the rhema word for you at this very moment. What would God have you to do? What's he saying to you at this moment? Now, the second thing, you've got to obey the word of the God, the word that God speaks to you. Remember verse 13, go and do as you have said, but make me a little cake first. Now, if she refuses to make that little cake first for the, for the prophet, then there's not going to be any supernatural increase, right? But I want you all to notice this. What the prophet told her to do was impossible in the natural. She didn't have enough to make one for him and then one for her and her son. There was only enough for one. What he was telling her to do was impossible. But because she obeyed the word of the Lord, at that moment, God brought supernatural increase. Okay? Yeah, that, that logic, boy, that stuff, getting you, it'll mess you up. So listen, when God speaks to you, don't think about it. Just do it. Remember what uh, Mary told the servants that day about Jesus? Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Just do it. Okay? Don't allow reason to teach you out of the abundance of God's goodness. Now look at verses 15 and 16. Thank God this woman was obedient. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah. She and he and her house did eat many days, the bear of oil wasted not, neither did the crews of oil fail. And as a matter of fact, if you study this out in Hebrew, you'll find they ate one full year. One full year until the famine was over and they didn't need the miracle anymore. That's amazing, isn't it, folks? Third thing is you need a point of contact. Remember, number one, you need a word. From the Lord, a prophetic word from God. Number two, you got to obey that word. Number three, you need a point of contact. In other words, some way or some way to release your faith. If you want to, just call it a spiritual reference point. A spiritual point of reference. Y'all remember the woman who said, if I just touched the hem of Jesus' garment, I shall be made whole. That was a point of contact. The point of contact, the place where she could hang her spiritual hat, so to speak, was a reference point where she could look back and say, I touched the hem of his garment. At that moment, that's when I believed I received the anointing to heal me, okay? See, a lot of people touched his clothes. Y'all remember that, right? Because the disciples, when Jesus asked, who touched me? He said, there's a crowd. A lot of people are touching you. So it wasn't the clothes itself that healed her, or else everybody that touched him would have been healed, right? But at that moment, she was the only one because she touched him in faith. She had a point of contact where her faith was released so that once she established that point of contact and touched him, it released the anointing. It's true with your physical body. It's true with your finances. It's true with your prayer life. 
you need a point of contact where you release your faith. I believe this today, just as much as it happened back in those days. I believe that if sick people will come to churches and hear the true teaching of the Word of God, if they're sitting there and they say, as soon as this service comes toward the end and prayer is made for the sick, I am going to go up and touch that man of God, and when I do, I will be healed. I'm going to put a demand upon the anointing that's upon him or her. It's just as real now as it was then. Amen? And Jesus said, the works that I do, you'll do also. Hallelujah. Think about that, folks. So now listen, as we're wrapping it up. The moment you establish your point of contact, I'm going to give you a, a point number four. The moment you establish your point of contact and act on the Word of God, believe that you receive. Believe that it's already done in the spirit realm. Act as if it's already done. Praise God that it's already done. You have a reference point. I don't care if a two weeks go by, a month goes by, nothing's happened in the natural realm. Just stand on the Word of God. Go back to that reference point. Go back to that point of contact on such and such date, such and such time. I sowed this amount of money. I had hands laid on me. I touched the man of God with my faith. Are you with me now? And believe, that is the time that it was done in the spirit realm. It may not have shown up in the natural realm yet, but it will if you will stand in faith. Don't doubt. Don't quit. Don't back off. Amen? Just hold fast to your confession of faith and expect a breakthrough. Now, you might want to write this down. I should have told you up front. The Lord spoke to me today, and he said, every breakthrough is a result of a new revelation. Every breakthrough is a result of a new revelation. Imagine when you got revelation on divine healing. Remember when you got the revelation of the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence speaking in tongues. I could take y'all back to the times where I was at, what was happening in my life when I got those revelations. And as soon as I got that revelation, I got a breakthrough. I struggled to be filled with the Holy Ghost with ever speaking in tongues because I didn't have revelation yet. I read it in the Bible. I heard people talking about it, and I wanted it because I knew it was real. I went to meetings where they was teaching, preaching on it. I even went to a meeting where they were praying for people, and I came away with nothing. But I got back into the Word and fellowship with God, praying, and the Lord spoke to me. He, now, I don't mean He spoke to me in an audible voice. I have had God speak to me in an audible voice before, but most of the time it's that inward voice, that silent voice of the Holy Spirit, inward witness, as a matter of fact. And that inward witness, he took me to two scriptures, how much more would the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And also, when you pray, believe you receive. I got revelation at that very moment. And the moment I got that revelation, I knelt down. I said, Father, I ask you to baptize me with the Holy Ghost, with evidence of speaking in tongues. I believe I received. I thank you for filling me. And I just got up and started praising him. I went back to work. My Pentecostal buddies asked me, said, you got filled with the Holy Ghost? Yes. I said, I sure have. I received. They said, do you speak in tongues? I said, not yet, but I will. They said, well, you had not got it yet. I said, yeah, I have. Amen. I said, because Jesus said, when you pray, believe you receive and you shall have. So I believe I received, and if I believe I received something, then I've got it. You've got to believe you got it before you get it. It's mine in the spirit realm. And it wasn't but just a few days later, I'm riding down the road. Got off second shift late at night, riding down the road in my old pickup truck with my eight-track tape in, listening to Dallas Home and Praise, worshiping God, just going down the road worshiping God. And all of a sudden, out of my belly came rivers of living water, and I began to speak with other tongues. See, that revelation brought a breakthrough in my life. Same thing happened with healing. Same thing happened with prosperity. I'm telling you, there are people sitting in Faith Family Church that do not have the revelation of prosperity yet. You believe it, but you don't have the revelation of it. When you get the revelation of it, you're excited about it. You can't hardly even, I mean, you can't keep from talking about it. I'm telling y'all. Hallelujah. 
Do y'all think if I didn't believe in, in divine prosperity the way the Bible talks about it, that I would, we'd be sowing seeds of $10,000, $15,000, I'm telling y'all, listen to me. How do you think that we can ever go from one level to the next if we don't get revelation and act on it? Amen. That woman we just read about, y'all, this is serious business. This woman's dying. She's watching her child starve to death. You think for a minute that she didn't get that revelation suddenly that she would have gave that last meal? But thank God she did. Well, now she could live. And we don't know how much longer she lived. She lived a long time. Hallelujah. Supernatural increase. Just know this. God is up to something good. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. We love you. We worship you. We praise your holy name. And Father, I just speak blessings right now upon every man, woman, boy, and girl that claims this church as their own, that claims us as their pastor, as their shepherd. I speak blessings upon them. I believe, Lord, because of their partnership through tithes and offerings, through prayer and serving, Lord, that there's going to be a supernatural increase more and more. They're going to experience blessings, them, their children, more and more in the days of head. And I decree that the new year will be the best year yet for each and every one, for Faith Family Church. I thank you, Father God, that you are able to spread a table, even in the wilderness, hallelujah, that we sow, even if it seems like it's in famine, yet we reap the same year a hundredfold. I praise you, Father God, that all things are possible to those that believe. And we are believers, Lord. We are believers and our faith is increasing more and more. We're seeing bigger. Oh, we're removing limitations, hallelujah. And we decree no more limits upon our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.